But humans were the only ones looking for the easy option. Just wait till you see the laziest loafers in the natural world. We're counting down the top 10 most extreme freeloaders in the animal kingdom to find the creature that spends the most time sponging off its host. Discover that all kinds of animals can get taken for a ride when freeloaders are pushed to the most extreme. Earth is a planet of extremes. Extreme places. And extreme animals. But some animals are more extreme than others. Join us as we count down to find the most unusual and the most extraordinary on Animal Planets, the most extreme. Number 10. Once upon a time in America, not everyone bought a ticket to ride on a train. During the Great Depression, it's estimated that hundreds of thousands of people became hobos, riding the rails in search of work. Freeloading from the railway companies wasn't without its dangers. But human hobos had it easy compared to our first contender. You can find it in the forests of South and Central America. Here, a rotting log is like a railway station for the eight-legged hobo crawling in to number 10 in the countdown, the pseudo-scorpion. It gets its name because it looks like its more famous cousin, except that it lacks the sting in its tail. Instead, it hunts like a spider using a pair of venomous pincers. These claws also come in handy when looking to hitch a ride. Not on a train, but a giant harlequin beetle. Having just emerged as an adult from its home inside a rotting log, the harlequin beetle is ready to take off to find a mate and a suitable tree to raise a family. Since flying sure beats walking, the beetle is about to pick up a freeloader. The pseudoscorpion is number 10 in the countdown because it's found a way to hop on board the Harlequin Express. By repeatedly pinching the beetle's bottom, the little hobo causes it to flex its abdomen and so open its wings just enough for the little freeloader to slip underneath. Since pseudoscorpions are small and the beetle is big, it can get crowded underneath the wing covers as other hobos climb on board. The pseudoscorpions strap themselves in by constructing safety harnesses of silk, because although takeoffs are smooth, the landings can be a little rough. Usually, it's only female pseudoscorpions that disembark and head off in search of a place to lay their eggs. They spin a silk chute to lower themselves safely to the ground. The males stay on board, because that's the best place to find another female. Pseudoscorpions mate in midair. That's why the boys fight for territories on the back of the beetle. The pseudoscorpion is number 10 in the countdown because some of the strongest males can spend two weeks hitching a ride. Eventually, they have to leave when their lust is overpowered by hunger. However, 
The Pseudoscorpion is a workaholic compared to the contenders we'll meet later in the countdown. That's because, still to come, are animal freeloaders that can spend all their lives on the scrounge. Number nine. Welcome to the Great Lakes of East Africa, home to the largest diversity of freshwater fish on the planet. With so many hungry mouths around, one group of cichlid fish guard their eggs by keeping them in their mouth. It's such a safe place that it's hard to imagine that it could be taken over by a freeloader. The story begins when the female cichlid releases her eggs and then scoops them up into her mouth. She even tries to swallow what looks like a row of eggs along the base of the male's tail. But these are fakes, and instead of eggs, she swallows enough sperm to fertilize the brood in her mouth. And this is when the pair are most vulnerable to the freeloader swimming in to number nine in the countdown, the catfish. It looks like the catfish are just after a free meal of cichlid eggs, but they're actually doing something far more sinister. As the catfish gulp down the cichlid eggs, they replace them with fertilized eggs of their own. In the confusion, the cichlid frantically swallows all the eggs around her. It's time for the catfish parents to leave, letting someone else do all the hard work of bringing up their babies. The female cichlid spends more than two weeks acting as an oral incubator. The trouble is, the alien eggs develop faster than her own babies. And what's worse, the catfish just love eating small cichlids. The female doesn't seem to notice that all her babies have been replaced by fat freeloaders. Thanks to this mom's devotion, childcare is easy for the catfish. At least these freeloaders only hang around for a few weeks, unlike the moochers coming up in the countdown. So far, we've seen fish in a mouth and bugs on a back, but still to come, we'll dig up the dirt on the world's laziest dragon. Number eight. If you were looking to find a most extreme freeloader, the last place you'd choose would be 300 miles north of the Arctic Circle. Wrangell Island is not the place you'd go for a holiday. In winter, it's a freezing wilderness, and you'd risk bumping into arguably the biggest, most bloodthirsty carnivore on four legs. While polar bears spend the winter hunting seals, there's something that hunts polar bears. In winter, the biggest carnivore on the island is chased by the smallest. It's a freeloader that's prepared to cross more than 600 miles of pack ice in temperatures 40 below zero. Trotting in to number eight in the countdown is the Arctic Fox. The polar bear has nothing to fear from a following fox. The small scavenger's only interested in scrounging scraps from a polar bear's kill. Researchers have calculated that to survive, 
A polar bear needs to eat one ring seal every six and a half days. Since the skin and blubber of seals make up about 90% of the polar bear's diet, there's often plenty of meat left on a carcass for an Arctic fox. It gets a free feast without having to go to all the trouble of hunting, provided that it doesn't get too close to an angry bear. Feasting on someone else's leftovers isn't a problem for a fox. It'll eat almost anything. When one scientist analyzing the diet of an Arctic fox accidentally lost a glove, he discovered pieces of it the next day in the stomach contents of three different foxes. In winter, Scrounging a free meal off a polar bear can mean the difference between life and death. But in summer, the situation changes dramatically. When the snows melt, polar bears find it much harder to catch seals. But for the Arctic fox, now in its dark summer coat, this is a land of plenty. With everything from fruit to nesting seabirds, there's lots of food for scavenging animals, which is why the polar bear now seems to be trailing the fox. The fox is used to being close to polar bears, but not that close. And that's why the Arctic fox is only number eight in our countdown. It's only in winter that it depends on the generosity of the polar bear, unlike the full-time freeloaders coming up in the countdown. Number seven. The island of Komodo is home to the largest lizard in the world. But just because it's big doesn't mean it's not lazy. The female Komodo dragon is number seven in our countdown of the most extreme freeloaders. Because even though she's quite capable of scratching out a nest for herself, when it's time to bury her eggs underground, she prefers to let someone else do all the hard work. She's looking for a nest site with maximum exposure to the fierce tropical sun. Yet, like all reptiles, she can't use her metabolism to regulate her body temperature. So, by about morning tea time, she has to find shade or cook. But scorching heat won't stop the diggers that made this massive mound. A pair of orange-footed scrub fowl nest inside the world's biggest compost heap. Could there be a better place for a lazy Komodo dragon? Beneath the layer of dirt scraped up by the scrub fowl, decomposing plant matter generates heat to incubate their egg. They maintain a constant temperature inside the mound by shifting up to 100 pounds of earth every day. Eventually, these birds can end up with a mound that measures over 50 feet in diameter and weighs in at 50 tons. That's plenty big enough for a Komodo dragon. Not only is the scrub fowl's nest perfectly positioned in full sunlight, it's much easier to dig in the loose dirt than trying to burrow through a hillside full of tree roots. The dragon simply has to extend the brush fowl's existing tunnels until they're 12 feet long, with an entrance large enough for her to turn around. She needs to lay her eggs deeper in the mound because her babies require lower incubating temperatures than the eggs of the scrub fowl.
During the six-month incubation period, most Komodo mothers stand guard over their buried treasure. They won't eat until the rainy season when food is abundant and the young dragons are on the verge of hatching. Inside their nest chamber, buried deep within the scrub fowl's compost heap, the young lizards emerge from their eggs, quite capable of looking after themselves. Researchers have found that Komodo dragons emerging from nests borrowed from the scrub fowl develop faster than those hatching in holes in the ground or hillsides. It seems that this fast incubation ensures that the hatchlings appear at the end of the wet season when their insect prey is most abundant. While it makes perfect sense for the free-loading dragons, spare a thought for the poor old scrub fowl. These birds may not want a family of lazy lizards destroying their carefully constructed mound. But when you're a little chicken, who's going to argue with a dragon? At least these massive lizards leave the birds alone, unlike our next contender. Number six. One of the world's most famous layabouts was the star of Aesop's fable, The Grasshopper and the Ant. The big green bug just sat around while the ant furiously collected food to store underground. A similar story plays out on Stevens Island off the coast of New Zealand. This is home to a freeloader that, just like the grasshopper, loves sitting around basking in the sunshine. Meet the Tuatara. It's the only survivor of a large group of reptiles that roamed the earth at the same time as the dinosaurs. It hasn't changed much in over 225 million years. And while this cold-blooded reptile has spent the day catching some rays, there's one hard-working animal that's been out at sea collecting food. It's the fairy prion. Just like the Komodo dragon and the scrub fowl, these two creatures have set up house together. And the Tuatara is number six in the countdown because it lets the bird do all the hard work. Fairy prions dig burrows up to six feet deep into the hillside. And while the Tuatara is a capable digger, researchers have found that it's happier to move into the seabird's little love nest. The prions don't particularly like the tuatara. Adult birds can usually defend themselves in a flurry of beak and claws if their housemate gets too close for comfort. So for the first three months, the prions pretty much ignore the freeloader in their midst. The trouble begins when they lay their eggs. While the parents share the incubation duties, sometimes they both leave the nest together. So what's a hungry Tuatara to do? Stand guard or help himself to some scrambled eggs? Studies have shown that Tuatara are responsible for the loss of more than 25% of fairy prion eggs and chicks. So when the parents return, they find an empty nest 
and a fat freeloader. Fortunately, tuatara predation seems to have no significant impact on the seabird population, which is why this horrible house guest continues to eat its hosts out of house and home. While our last two contenders were both scaly squatters looking for a home underground, coming up, we go searching. Number five. Some people think that freeloaders are just scum-sucking bottom dwellers but they're actually describing an animal with a rather unfortunate problem. It looks like something nasty you'd wipe off the bottom of your shoe. Meet the sea cucumber. A cousin of the starfish, this shapeless sausage is an underwater vacuum cleaner that sucks up everything from droppings to dead bodies. Every year it can filter more than 250 pounds of organic waste. Most humans think it's pretty disgusting, but not the animals swimming in to number five in the countdown, the pearl fish. Just like the Komodo dragon and the tuatara, this tiny eel-like fish is a freeloader that shares a residence with another animal. Only the pearl fish chooses some of the strangest accommodation in the world. When it first finds a sea cucumber, it appears to smell the length of its body. Scientists have speculated that it seems to be listening, trying to hear what's going on inside the cucumber. Then it makes its way to the back door and gently knocks at the entrance. The pearl fish is number five in the countdown because it makes itself right at home inside the intestines of the sea cucumber. But if you think that's strange, don't forget that the sea cucumber's not the only animal with a gut full of freeloaders. It's been estimated that while your body is made up of about 10 trillion cells, there are probably 10 times that many microorganisms living inside your digestive system. There are about 500 species of bacteria in your large intestine. We keep them nice and warm and provide them with a constant supply of food. Most of these freeloaders earn their keep by breaking down fiber, producing vitamins, and preventing the growth of harmful species. And while most people don't know that they're full of bacteria, they'd know all about it if a pearl fish decided to take up residence in their digestive system. Very little is known about what the pearl fish actually does inside the sea cucumber. Some species will pop out to feed, while others seem partial to nibbling at the cucumber's intestines. However, the pearl fish doesn't seem to cause any serious damage. It spends most of its life within this strange but smelly sanctuary which is why the pearl fish has slid into number five in the countdown. Number four. Of all the strange places to pick up a freeloader, the weirdest of them all must be in a moth's ear hole. Moths do have ears. They use them to detect the sounds of oncoming predators. But this tiny orifice is also home to the animal lurking at number four in the countdown. As this moth sucks up nectar, little does it know that it's about to pick up a hitchhiker. 
The long tube of its proboscis makes an excellent drinking straw and a boarding gate for a microscopic mite. Mites are eight-legged cousins of spiders. And this particular species specializes in setting up home inside the ear of a moth. It crawls through the hairs and scales on the moth's face to examine both ears before choosing one to call home. The first thing it does is to pierce the delicate membrane separating the inner and outer ears, destroying the moth's ability to hear in that ear. Then, just like a flea, it drinks a little blood and settles down to produce a family. The ear mite is number four in the countdown because it eats, sleeps, and breeds inside the head of its host. But it is very considerate. The mites will only ever puncture one ear because a completely deaf moth wouldn't be able to hear an approaching bat. These fishermen go hunting with an animal that knows it's much easier to hitch a ride than to go swimming. So, by carefully tying a line around its tail, the fishermen gently release their living fish hook. Just like a heat-seeking missile, it sets off in search of a target. This fish doesn't hunt minnows. It's only interested in animals big enough to give it a free ride. And when it finds something, it doesn't bite, but suck. Its front dorsal fin has become a suction pad. All it has to do is find something big in the water and stick its head onto it. No wonder it's called the sucker fish or remora. For the fishermen, it's a great way to catch a meal. For the remora, it's a great way to live. A remora will cling onto anything big in the water, be it a boat or even a human. Usually, they're found on turtles, whales, sharks, and the largest fish in the sea, the whale shark. There are plenty of other fish that hitch a lift from a whale shark. They get pushed along, like riding the bow wave of a ship. But the remora is the only freeloader that can stop swimming altogether, thanks to the suction disc on top of its head. The disc is made up of slat-like structures that open and close to take a firm hold on the skin. By sliding backward, the remora can increase the suction. So the faster its host swims, the better the grip. To release itself, it just has to swim forward. The remora is number three in the countdown because it not only steals a ride on bigger animals, it also scrounges a free meal. The remora are thought to feed on everything from parasites on the skin to feces to scraps that fall out of its host's mouth. For the remora, life is so easy that it seems the only sucker around here is the big fish that carries this little freeloader. Number two. The forests of New Zealand are home to a freeloader that's completely dependent on the generosity of another animal. A hollow tree is the communal home for short-tailed bats.
These flying mammals can easily move through the forest to eat insects, fruit, and flowers. If only life was as easy for the animal crawling in to number two in the countdown. It's a fly that can't fly. It's lost its wings and now is totally dependent on bats for its home, food, and transportation. As many as 10 flies can be found in the fur of one bat when it leaves the roost to feed at night. Scale those flies up to human size and it would be like walking around with 10 lobsters in your underpants. The bats don't seem to worry too much about carrying the freeloaders from roost to roost. They'll even tolerate the bugs feeding on secretions produced by the bat's mouth, eyes, and rear end. And since the flies don't want to leave their babies behind, they even time their reproduction to coincide with the bats. The maggots may look helpless, but it doesn't take long for them to develop powerful legs to cling to the fur of the bats. It's been suggested that since these flies have such close connections with their host, they have a level of social behavior unknown in any other fly. The flies live side by side with their babies and even groom each other. While the bats and their hitchhiking bugs live in harmony, not all freeloaders are as harmless. Number one. Welcome to the largest collection of extreme freeloaders in America. It's the perfect place to find the animal lurking at number one in the countdown. It looks like fettuccine, but you wouldn't want this in your stomach. It's a worm, a tapeworm. How would you like to have this coiled up inside your belly? Since we give it all the food it can eat and a warm place to live, it never has to leave. It's the perfect freeloader. We're home to more than 25 different species, so there are a lot of tapeworms out there, as Dr. Eric Hoberg explains. In humans right now, there are probably are about 9 to 10 million people uh, on the planet that are infected with these tapeworms. And this is only one of 30 million species at the National Parasite Collection in Beltsville, Maryland. Each parasite comes complete with a very personal history. The tapeworm on these slides came out of an Inuit hunter who lived off the coast of Alaska in 1969. This tapeworm could be 20 or 30 years old. Each segment contains all of the reproductive organs. Millions and millions of eggs are produced by this tapeworm over its lifetime. That's because these freeloaders have a problem. How do they find a new host for their children? The answer is to produce a million eggs every day. They're found in segments that break off the tapeworm's body and pass out of the gut. And since the eggs are in pooey packages, they catch the eye of hungry scavengers. But birds are only temporary hosts. The tapeworm needs to move into something much bigger. So it gets passed out inside another messy missile. Once inside a cow, 
the parasite makes its way into the muscle tissue. That's how it will eventually end up back inside meat-eating humans. It's an incredibly complicated life cycle, and one that relies on several different animals, including humans, to do all the hard work. And that's why this remarkable freeloader is number one in the countdown. The tapeworm has found ways to scrounge its food, its home, and transport for its eggs. That means the only thing it has to do is kick back and make babies. Which is why, when it comes to freeloading, there's no doubt that the tapeworm really is the most extreme.